dealing with regrets of the past. Dealing with regrets of the past. I think this message is very timely. We've got, as I say, two to three weeks left to deal, put the garbage out, as it were. I could have said putting the garbage out is probably a better, to- a better title, actually, but that's what this is about. The pilgrimage of life could be seen as a highway that's littered with trash. When I look back over my life, it's like driving down a highway in a car with boxes flying at you and bits of garbage and you're trying to navigate the road. (laughs) And that's how I see life for all of us. We all try to navigate that trash in some way and we do as, as well as we can. The prophet Joel, he leaves us in no doubt in this time that the years that the locust has taken from us will be restored. It's a promise. The promise predominantly is for Israel, we know that. But we've been grafted in, so this promise can apply to us also. And the proviso of that, of course, is that we turn back to God. We must turn back to him. The hope of a better day is always ahead of you. And uh, the hardest thing, of course, is getting to that better day. We know that. The goal is the better day that's ahead of us. And um, I wrote this down because it meant something to me. There's two significant days in our life. The day we're born. And the day we realize why we were born. I think that's true for all of us. We're in a season of transition, restoration, where the Father is calling his children to sit with him and partake of what's at the table he's prepared for us. There's a table that's been prepared for this coming season. And so where there's been discouragement, loss of one's identity, illness, etc., behaviours that will keep us from fulfilling our call. He's offered an exchange on the table. There's an exchange. He's prepared something for us. But to partake in that, we have to exchange what's stopping us from partaking in that. Please take notice of the timing of this because we've gone along through life, living our life, from day to day, often without purpose, but you've got to have a purpose in this hour. You really, we are right down to the wire, timing-wise. We're talking weeks here. So we've got to focus on dealing with our lives, with the garbage in our lives. It's got to be primarily our focus. It's not about building churches or anything. It's about dealing with our life because we're nearly out of time. And if we don't do it now... I believe, this is my personal belief, God will not use us in that next season. That next seven year period is the final thrust in the kingdom of God and I believe we'll be left outside of it. I don't believe that you can come back in in that season. The Bible said that men's hearts will fail them because of fear. So as things start to unfold, man will be so caught up in what's happening He will not address himself. This is a time of rest. We have got to appreciate this period of rest. Mm -hmm. That's why I believe God is allowing these types of things to happen. He said, you've got to rest. You have got to allow your body to heal so you can be used in this next season. You've got to allow your mind to heal. You've got to restrain yourself. I think of my mother when I used to go to the supermarket, a little kid. I can still remember this. I don't know how, but she had these... Rains, they used to call them. The thing is, wow, like that, pull your back when you run ahead. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, that's what God's wanting to do. But if 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 we won't do that ourselves, He's going, Whoa. and then if we still won't listen, then I think we've, well, excuse my expression, passed the use by. We're not going to be of any value to Him. He's giving us all the timing, all the warnings. 
And I think we need to listen. So to partake of this table, leave your old garments at the door. (laughs) I'm using some metaphors here, but you understand what they mean. Leave your garments at the door, the soiled garments. Leave your boots at the door. Sorry, guys, I forgot to take mine off this morning. (laughs) Um, Leave that at the door. There's a new garment to partake in the season of what he's got for you. That garment has to be the garment of praise. We cannot continue talking the problems. We cannot continue being negative. We cannot continue hanging around people who are being negative. It's time to sever those people off in your life. Mm -hmm. Sorry if it sounds harsh. Mm -hmm. You need to be around people that are going to stand with you and strengthen you in this hour. Mm -hmm. This is not a season for the garment to get soiled anymore. Leave the old boots at the door and put on the new boots, which are the feet shod with the preparation of salvation, the gospel of peace. Our our feet are what carry peace in our life. Mm -hmm. Amen. So that's what we're coming into. You may not hear this type of preaching again because the season we're coming into is going to be full on. Those old garments are going to leave you naked, I wrote down. I don't want to be found naked. The new garments is one of thanksgiving, one of praise. The peace that will come in this hour can only come from fully trusting in the Father and spending time in His presence. So when the trials come, you are not moved. Peace, my peace I leave unto you, Jesus said, is is one of the greatest things we need in the hour that we're coming into. Mm. And the devil's going to do all he can to stop your peace. Mm. And I wrote this down for whoever it's for, because it's for me. The devil's going to do all he can to stop your peace by planting people to weigh you down. Mm. Watch out for the devil's plants in your life. Separate yourself from those that will weigh you down. Mm. The spirit that's upon these type of people is a spirit of rejection. And the idea is with the spirit is to bring you into a place the same as them. Be careful. Be careful. It will try and hinder you. It will try and pull you down. The way the Spirit enters is through speaking unedifying words. People who are dwelling on problems, talking problems, talking down on others. Complaining. So be careful. There has to be an exchange. The prophet Isaiah said, put on the garment of praise. Amen? For the Spirit of heaven. There has to be an exchange. Only we can do that. Each one of us have got problems, let's be honest. Each one of us are going through trials, let's be honest. Some of us more than others. Come on. But we have to do this stuff. God can only do so much. Sometimes we expect him to do it all, but we actually have to also engage and do something. This is why Paul in the midnight hour exchanged the torment of that prison cell for praise and worship. No matter how difficult it may seem. I had so many people call me when what happened to Amy. And I'm so thankful for the encouragement. But I would tell you, I didn't allow it to get me down. I had every opportunity. I didn't allow it. The proof is, I think, you can tell by my message I heard from the Holy Spirit. <coughs> don't allow, doesn't matter how severe, how bad things are, don't allow that to get you down. 
You are more than a conqueror. Amen. <laughs> you are more than a conqueror. Amen. See, there's a heaviness that comes with discouragement, but there's a joy that strengthens us as we open ourselves to His presence. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah eight ten. Do not be dejected, why? For the joy of the Lord is your strength. <laughs> wow. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Oh, when we can see that he's in control of everything, we stop fighting. When we understand how sovereign he is, how, how loving he is, how gracious he is, we see those problems in a different light. We're looking at them through a different set of eyes. We see that God is allowing these things to shape me, to strengthen me. He's allowing things because he loves me. He's not the one inflicting those things. Please hear where I'm coming from. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, I want to read this. I'm actually going to read a bit of scripture today because this really touched me early in the week when this happened. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit speaks in our time of need if we allow ourselves to hear him. 2 Samuel chapter 9, and I'm going to read the whole chapter. Now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service, my lord. And the king said unto him, is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. And so the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Micah, the son of Emil in Lodabar. Then King David said, Bring him to me. Bring him from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and he prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here I am. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather. And you shall eat bread. At my table continually. And then he bowed himself and he said, What is your servant that you should look unto such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. And now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. And then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. And as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as of one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwell in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem for he ate continually at the king's table and he was lame in both of his feet. I say, the background, of course, we know Saul has been killed, Jonathan's been killed, and Jonathan leaves behind his offspring, this little boy at the age of five years old. And the maid picks up, or the nanny picks up the little boy in her haste, and she runs for safety. And in that trying to do good, she slips. And she drops the little boy, the five-year-old, to the ground. 
damages his legs for life and he becomes a cripple. That's the background of the story here. Seems so unfair what happened to the little boy. He loses his grandfather, the king. He loses his father, the best friend of David, Jonathan. But more importantly, what I want to glean from this story is, is some nuggets for us to take today because they apply to each one of us. A brief mistake changes the life of Mephibosheth from his royal position now to be hidden away in a desert town called Lodabar. A place that very few know about. And sometimes in our haste, unintentionally, we make mistakes and we can inflict pain, harm, lasting pain upon some people. We've all done it. None of us are excluded from this. The result of that can leave guilt for me. It can leave shame for me. It can leave unforgiveness to myself. And forgiving someone else is so much easier than forgiving yourself. I don't know if you know that, but it is. It's much easier to forgive you than it is to forgive myself. And here we're, we've got a situation that Mephibosheth now is hidden away from what his life has been in a palace royalty to now living in this place called Lodabar, which literally means a place without pasture. And if you break down the two words in Hebrew context, which I did, the word lo means no, and the word debar means fruit, fruit, fruitfulness. In other words, no fruitfulness in this place. I don't know about you, but there's times in my life when there's been no fruit. When we're in that desert, we're away from the palace or because we are royalty. And when something happens that is a mistake through whatever reason, we end up blaming ourselves and we head for the desert and we hide out and we become fruitless in the kingdom of God. And we spend our lives trying to defend ourselves and protect ourselves from any more hurt. And this is what's happened to this little boy. He's been separated now from his father. And that's what happens in a time when we're fruitless. We become separated. We're no longer hearing our father's voice. Imagine five years old. You know where you've come from. And now you're living in squalor. In hardship. In a place that. Is mere existence. You're surviving only. I'm sure we can relate to this in some way. I'm sure each one of us, the Holy Spirit, will minister to you about this. Your identity now has been changed. You knew before your royalty. And now all of a sudden your identity has changed. And over a period of time, living in that desert place, you forget what it was like to live in royalty. You forget what it was like. To live as a child of the king. Or in this case a grandchild. The wounds of failure, be it our own or another, leave the same result always. And crippled and our true identity gets removed from us. So maybe you can see where I'm heading with this. And Mephibosheth would have only known his father from what others told him now. Because he was only small. So he would have heard all these stories about this great King Saul and his father Jonathan, the prince. And 
and how they had won battles and all these wonderful things. No different than a believer in God hears about their father. But there's one thing about hearing about your father. It's different when you have intimacy with your father and you know him. It's different when you feel his touch than you just hear about him. It's different when you live in his presence and you hear his voice. It's different when you partake of his tables. Mm. And this is what Mephibosheth finds himself in. It's easy to say we love him, as we will do, but it's a lot harder to say we feel your love. It's a lot harder to be, if we're honest, to say, I feel his love. But it's a lot easier to say, I love you. Isn't that true? The pursuit of truth is paramount to all of us. To me, it's right up there at the top of my list. The pursuit of truth. Because once we know the truth, the truth will set us free, the Bible says. And as much as it's important to know truth, I want to tell you it's not the most important thing. The Father's love is the most important thing. Love is more important than truth. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Do you want biblical evidence? I'll give you some. The woman who's caught in adultery. She knew what she had coming, because that was truth, law. But Jesus said, which one of you can cast the first stone? In other words, it's true she's been caught in adultery. It's true she deserves this punishment. It's true you could go ahead and do this, but make sure before you do, it can't be held back against you. Because see, what we judge will always come back and judge us. And we must remember that as high a value as we place on truth, and we should, love is a higher value. The Pharisees are a good example of this. They understood truth. Let's not get caught up in putting truth before love. But let's always temper truth with love. Judge not that you be not judged. For whatever we judge, we will be tormented with. That's a hard word. But that was the words of Jesus paraphrased. Whatever we judge will torment us. Or bless us. And despite our past, we must always remember there's a king who loves us. Mephibosheth is summoned now into the king's presence. And David becomes a surrogate father. We all need a surrogate father. <laughs> He's called God. Because our fathers have failed us to some degree along the way. That's, that's life. And bowing to the king, Mephibosheth reflects who he really is now, this beaten down, as he sees it, dog. In other words, I have no value anymore. That's how he sees himself. Years of pain, discouragement, he's lost his identity and royalty and that new identity has shaped him to feel like a nobody. And notice in the story, David totally ignores his comments. He doesn't even respond to them like a loving father. And the hardest person's always got to be yourself to forgive. The person who lives under self-condemnation becomes an ineffective in their calling. And actually we become our worst enemy because we end up inflicting pain on others. When we can't forgive ourselves, we carry that wherever we go. David in Psalm 31, he bears his soul as he cries out to God for deliverance. And I don't know the setting of the psalm, 
it's it's a little bit different than when David slept with Bathsheba, but this is a psalm of lament, and David's carrying a deep grief here. What he reveals in Psalm 31 is this desperate need for his loving Father God. And his cry is from his heart and it's real. And it's not masked with anything. It's deep from his heart, as David's psalms often portrayed him to be. And he's crying out to his father in desperation for an answer to free him from an anguish that he's carrying. And, 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 and yeah, I, I don't normally do this much. I just want to read the, the psalm. Some of it, not all of it. The word of King Lemuel, excuse my, the utterance which his mother taught him. What my son and what son, oh I'm reading Proverbs, I'm sorry, my goodness. You probably thought he has got a very different translation. <laughs> In you, O oh Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge. A fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and you are my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net which they have securely laid for me. For you are my strength. And into your hand... I commit my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Forgive me for reading you the wrong translation before. And it's in these times that there's no one else to blame except ourselves. And that's what David's doing here. Taking responsibility. And he's reminding God that he is his rock, he is his strength, and that he needs him. And that's what we need to do is to be big enough and brave enough and honest enough to be transparent enough with God and with others and say I've blown it. There's no shame in that. The shame is not saying it. In verse 9 he says, Have mercy on me for I am in distress or I am in trouble. My eyes waste away with grief. And you can see here David has been crying. This is a king. David's been crying before God. Verse 10, my strength fails me because of my sin. When we feel we don't have any strength, we need to look at ourselves. Why? Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. David acknowledges his sin has stripped his strength away. And the guilt that accompanies sin is always so overwhelming. Hmm? The voice that doesn't stop accusing. That voice that day and night you cannot silence. And we run from. And that's why we have people addicted to drugs and alcohol, sex, religion, whatever. Because they're running from that voice that just won't shut up. It's called conscience. <laughs> It's what God places in us to pull us back, to rein us back from those things that cause us to run from Him. And that's how He loves us so much. In verse 11, I am a reproach amongst my enemies, especially amongst my neighbors. I am repulsive to those that know me. I looked this up before I come this morning in the Message Bible. I don't use that Bible often, but listen to what it says. Just two verses. Verses, no, sorry, three. Verses 9 to verses 11. Follow it in the King James. This is the message. Be kind to me, God. I'm in deep, deep trouble again. I've cried my eyes out. I feel hollow inside. My life leaks away, groan by groan. My years fade out in size. My troubles have worn me out. Turn my bones to powder. To my enemies, I'm nothing more than a monster. I'm ridiculed by my neighbor. 
My friends are horrified with me. They even cross the street to avoid me. I think it sums it up pretty good. Huh? It's a pretty good translation. It gives us the right picture of what David feels. You felt like that? I have. This is what David's going through. But he's honest enough to be transparent before God. And that's all God requires of us, is that transparency. The martyred missionary to Ecuador, James Elliot. I don't know if you've ever read any of his writing. Fantastic if you haven't. James Elliot. He says, a saint who advances on his knees never retreats. Mm-hmm. He was one of five that got killed going in to try and minister to a tribe. As, as a young man, a saint who advances on his knees never retreats. And prayer at, at, at these times of what David is going through, what we've all gone through or maybe going through now, is the only solution that will overcome those stresses of failure. Only prayer. Not people, not drugs, not church, not religion. Nothing except prayer. Because that's all God is waiting for, is that exchange of transparency so he Mm. can touch deeply into that womb. And self-examination is a quality David shows us in the Psalms that we need to learn from. Self-examination. That ability to express express the truth of our feelings, our failures. And as we read Psalms like this, the Psalm starts to read us. As we read these Psalms, they will start to read us and teach us. Thank God that David journaled his psalms. I mean, he must have had a busy life. (laughs) But he still took time to journal the psalms. I think that's a lesson that all of us, including myself, can learn from. Keep a journal. Not a diary, a journal. A journal of things that daily you can write like this. A diary is different. Verse 14, but as for me, I trust you, O Lord. Verse 15, deliver me from those who persecute me. Verse 17, do not let me be ashamed, for I have called to you. Verse 19, oh, how great is your goodness for those that fear you. Verse 20, you shall hide them in the secret place eh, of your presence. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. That's the same as Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place. Verse 24. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. All you who hope in the Lord. And there's a good verse for you. Be of good courage. For he will strengthen your heart. Mm -hmm. We cannot look at the subject of past regrets without mentioning the keys to move beyond those regrets, which is always forgiveness. I know we know this, but it's a good reminder. I try weekly to consider who I may have hurt or who may have hurt me so I can address that quickly. I don't want to carry that baggage. And Matthew 5 deals with me offending others. Matthew 18 always deals with others offending me. So Matthew 5, verse 23, 24, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, remember your brother has something against you. Leave your gift at the altar and go away. In other words, you're wasting your time going to church. (laughs) That's basically what it's saying. (laughs) Go away and deal with it. Ouch. Yeah. So that sort of emptied most of the churches out right there. (laughs) Forget building the new buildings. Deal with the stuff first. Why? Because he's not going to hear our cries otherwise. Everything with God is conditional. Notice there's some verbs here. First one is leave. 
The second one is go. And the third one is be reconciled. My experience is this. Not everyone that you try and deal with these issues will be reconciled back to you. That's my experience. Mm -hmm. And it's not your job to cause the reconciliation. That's God's job. He's the healer. But it is our job to put our part right with Him. It's His job to do the rest. There has to be a willingness to have done all that we can do to reconcile, to say sorry, in other words. Matthew 18, verse 21, Peter came to him and said, Lord, Lord, how often shall I forgive? We know the story. And seven times, Jesus says 70 times seven. He may as well say a billion times. That's what he meant, basically. There's no ending to this. And Jesus gives this wonderful story of a man who forgives a servant this large debt. And then he can't forgive his servant a smaller debt. And what we learn from that is the outcome, and that is that that servant is tormented for the rest of his life. So for us, if we have any torment, whatever it may be, we need to address this issue. Because it's a sign that we've opened ourselves up to the The torment of unforgiveness is so real. I know, I've lived with it in my life before. It's so real. It gives you no peace. Where you can no longer rest in Him. Where you can no longer be still and know He is God. That is the torment that He's talking about. Where you have to be on the go and you can't be at peace. That's torment. Having done all we can to say sorry, we then must forgive ourselves, which is the hardest part of all of this. Because when we blow it, we're hard on ourselves. True. I know I'm much harder on myself than I am anyone else. And I, I can be hard on people. <laughs> so I am dreadfully hard on myself. I'm going to say something here that I learned. If we don't forgive ourselves, the same torment will torment us. So it's not just about trying to put it right with the other person. It's about forgiving yourself also. That torment will come back on you the same. So I hope that helps. Because it's helped my life. It's a lot easier to forgive someone else. It's a lot easier to say sorry. Than it is to forgive yourself. And when we genuinely forgive. We set a prisoner free. And at the end of it. We realise the prisoner was me. Mm. Huh? <coughs> the prisoner is always me that needs to be set free. It's interesting, you know, when you offend someone, it's always your move. It's like a game of chess. And when someone offends you, it's always your move. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't give any place to the enemy here. Because this is integral for where we're heading in the next few weeks. Take the time to be still and deal with this stuff. And you may say, well, I've done it all, praise the Lord. But it's my job to impart what the Holy Spirit gives me. He gives it for a reason, and it's not just for me. I know that, because I'm not preaching stuff I haven't done. <laughs> so if he's given it to me, I suggest there's someone or some that need to hear this, either here or on the tape. Father, we thank you for your word. We see the love of a heavenly father, a royal father, the 
king of kings that we're a part of that royal family. And Lord, there has been times in each of our lives where we've been in that desert place, Lodaba, a place of unfruitfulness, a place of struggling just to live each day and survive. Each one of us, Lord, have been there. And Lord, maybe there's some here or, or on the tape that are still there. And Lord, I pray you impart to them with your love that they are part of your royal family. They are a child of the King, the King of Kings. Oh Lord, let that become a reality. Lord, bring us back into that place of intimacy and fellowship yes. with the loving Father. Strip away, Lord, any hurt feelings, any feelings of guilt and shame for what we may have done or may not have done, Lord, and give us the strength to do those things we need to do, I pray. Yes. Amen. And Lord, then teach us how to forgive ourselves, yes. Yes. that we may walk shameless, guiltless, and free of any condemnation, for there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit and not the flesh. Let this be a day of restoration in our own hearts, O oh God. Let this message penetrate each hearer of it. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus, be glorified this day across this earth and in the heavens. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all.